Well, good morning, everybody. How are you this morning? Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Well, thank you for being. I do want to thank you for being here and uh, just taking the time to be at the house of the Lord to hear from God this morning and just to hear what he has to say. Uh, Brian is out this morning. He is at a conference this week. Uh, He left yesterday with Pradeep Lima to travel to Ohio to First Baptist Church in a little town called New Philadelphia. And uh, it's the uh, Certainty Conference. Uh, Brian has been anticipating this for about a year, and he is one of the main speakers in the daytime sessions. And so he definitely could uh, use your prayers. He covers your prayers. He just wants me to mention that. Uh, This is one of what's called an LFF or a Living Faith Fellowship Conference. And uh, I wanted to mention Living Faith. It's It's a group of churches uh, that we have partnered with over the last couple of years. Many of them have been here. Some of them are in other states, and you probably, have never, you probably will never visit them. But Living Faith Fellowship is a group of churches that are, have, have really come together for a reason, and that reason is, is around the, the, the Bible, uh, the, uh, faith-based edu- uh, a faith-based view of the Bible. What does that mean? That means that we believe the book. Amen? I mean, I think everybody in this room believes the Bible, and it's, adheres to it that it's God's Word. There's a lot of churches out there that don't do that. And so we've aligned ourselves with churches that do still hold to the Bible as the Word of God, the inspired, preserved Word of God in the King James Bible. And then uh, education. We believe in teaching people how to study the Bible and how to use the Bible. And then uh, missions. And so we partner together. One of the things you might realize at the Bible conference... Uh, week, week before last was there's a lot of people here that don't normally attend Heartland. Uh, they were from some of those LFF churches, and we're thankful that they came down and partnered with us to put those Bibles together. So just pray for Brian, uh, Brian as he is uh, preaching this morning. Well, he's not preaching this morning, but he will be tomorrow morning. He'll be teaching all three days on the subject of prophecy. Um, not that is a uh, we're not trying to make prophecy. We're trying to understand prophecy in, in the book. So he's preaching on that, teaching on that over the next three days. Um, and so, let me just tell you, why, why did I, I wanted to show this video. I always put together a video bef- at the end of the Bible conference, but if you recall, last Sunday, we just didn't have the time. Uh, there had a, we had a lot of things going on. One of the things we had to do was to recognize Brian. Um, Brian wanted to recognize uh, Brad McGuire as being uh, gone out to start New Life, Bible, or New, New Life Baptist Church, get the right name, over in Clinton, and today is their first service on Sunday, so they could use your prayers as well. Uh, the thing that is happening over there is that it is going to be a really um, positive thing for us to send out a church to accomplish God's work there, just like He's been doing here. So I wanted to show the video because the video actually has something to do with what I want to talk about this morning, and, uh, and so it's important that we see, when we look at the Bible... It's a reminder, as we look at this video, it's a reminder of what the Bible is. The Bible and its distribution is the most critically important work that the church can do. There's nothing else that we do that is more important than getting the Word of God out. And so we need to be reminded of the Bible conference and why we do the Bible conference. We had the opportunity to put together, as you saw in the video, 21,000 books. I I lump it all together. Uh, because the work was great, and the people that came, if you were part of that at any point, even if you just prayed for the work to get done, thank you for that, because it, we needed that. So th- it's just important that we understand that no matter what happens, uh, we need to understand that the, cr- the most critical thing is to get the Word of God out. These, uh, these Bibles and these John and Romans, they, they, uh, they have no importance outside of getting it into the hands of people who don't have a Bible. I mean, you might have, I mean, I know I do. I have, I I don't even want to say the number. I have several Bibles in my house. How many of you have more than one Bible in your house? Okay, pretty much everybody in the room. There are people in the world, though, that do not have one Bible, do not have one portion of Scripture, do not even know who Jesus Christ is, and it's our task, it's our responsibility. You know why you got left here after you got saved? was to proclaim Christ, right? So we have work to do. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to connect the Bible conference with some things. I want to, I want to link all of these things together. Um, so 
If you, if you think about Romans chapter 10 for just a moment, you don't have to turn over there. I'll just read it to you real quick. But in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15 says, How shall they call upon him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they not believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know that verse, right? We've got to have somebody proclaiming the Word of God. And then it goes on in verse 15. It says, How shall they preach except they be sent? There's got to be a sending. There's got to be a movement of something from this church outward to the world. And that world starts uh, pretty much at, your, at the length of your arm. Okay, anything, anything beyond the length of your arm, I would call that the world. Okay, so when I'm not just necessarily talking about across the ocean or anything like that. He goes on, How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So a preacher is needed for sure. We need to have somebody preach the Word of God. Uh, and the printed Word is powerful. And people can get saved by, print, by reading the, the printed Word. Because, and this is the reason why, because the Scripture is a living letter from God. It is a living Word. It is a living book. And, just, and, and we, want, we need to understand that just because you have a Bible, just because you have given it to somebody, your task is not done. And what I want to do today is connect the fact that we put Bibles together and sent them, and you, just like that Bible, are a living epistle. And we need to be sent as well. We need to be read of men. And we need to understand what's going on here. So, uh, I'm, be turning over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I just want to start with this. This is not, a, uh, this is not where we're going to camp out, but I do want to start here, um, and so that we can... Get a context. 2 Corinthians 3 2. I'm going to read the verse uh, and then um, we'll pray and then we'll jump into the study. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are just so thankful that you trust us with your word to handle the written word. But not only that, you have, you have chosen to use us as a vessel to carry your living word to the world. I pray, Father, this morning that this message uh, would have an impact in my life, in our life, in the life of this church. I want to pray also as we're, as we're here right now, Father, just take a moment and pray for New Life Baptist Church as they're uh, getting ready to have their first service. And I want to pray for uh, our pastor as he is uh, preparing to teach a very important subject uh, out of your word. And, and he, with all of those things going on, Father, we know that even right now that there are little children being taught the Bible in this building. And we don't want to lose sight of the fact that they're beginning to hear from you. Uh, and I pray for them as well. And Father, I just ask that you would just, uh, just bless this time, that you would encourage us uh, by this text that we're looking at this morning. And I just pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is Paul's second letter uh, that he wrote to the church at Corinth, right? Uh, this is Paul's second letter, and he, because he sent them the first letter, and he had to rebuke them. He had to speak to them about some things that they were doing. In fact, um, he actually says, your problem in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, he says, your problem is as you are carnal and you walk as men. And he had to rebuke them in 16 chapters over and over and over uh, of just telling them, this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you need to do. This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you need to do. And after giving that letter, after writing that letter, in this second letter, he changes his tone completely. And uh, it's, it's, it's this letter, the second letter, is to encourage them, to motivate them in the Word of God, and to motivate them in their role in the world. See, we all have a role, just like they were focused inward. They were focused on themselves. They were focused on the flesh. And Paul had to say, look, you need to change your focus. We need to change our focus sometimes, too. Some, you know, sometimes we just need to dial it in just a little bit more so we can see beyond ourselves and see exactly what God is doing, where God is trying to go with us. He's trying to take us someplace, amen? And so, in this verse, uh, verses 2 and 3, uh, Paul describes how important the church is uh, to God's plan. Not only that, but how important the church is to him. 
how important this church is to me, how important this church is to God. Uh, there's, a, there's a valid reason that God loves His people. It's because He has a desire for them. And so, let me just give you a little background on this verse, these two verses here. Because of 1 Corinthians chapter, or, well, the whole book of 1 Corinthians, because of that book, uh, there were some men, some people in Corinth who had, they didn't like the letter. They kind of got themselves offended a little bit. They didn't care much for it. And so they began to challenge Paul and say, well, who do you think you are? And, and, and I mean, what, what is your right to come and tell us who you think, you know, what we should be doing? Sometimes we do that ourselves. Sometimes we even look at our pastor, maybe in our heart or our mind, not verbally, I hope. Uh, but sometimes we say, well, pastor, who do you think you are? I'm a Christian too. You know, but there's a reason for it because God has said, I'm working through this person to affect your life. I'm working through this person to affect this church. And so Paul is being challenged uh, by some of these men about, give me evidence of your authority to say this. And so it was a rebuke to Paul. It was a rebuke of his position and his leadership. And he says, he said to them, look back in chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. And he says in verse 1, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? See, they were challenging him. Say, hey, give me, give me some background. Give me some documentation that proves that you have the right to say to me what you're saying to me. And Paul says, do I really need a letter? Do I really need some authority from some other external source to say that I have the right to talk to you this way? Don't you get it? You're saved because of me. You're my epistle. You're my commendation. If it wasn't for your, this church wouldn't be here. If God had not worked through me to accomplish something. He says, I don't need that. I, I love you. I'm telling you this because I care about you and because I want you to flourish and I want you to grow and I want you to be all that you can be for God. And so uh, he calls them, this church, he calls them an epistle, right? He says, you are, uh, you are my epistle. How does he say that? He goes, you are our epistle written on our hearts. Now, <clears throat> what he's saying here. Uh, is more than just a letter. Sometimes we like to call this a book, you know, the book of 1 Corinthians, the book of 2 Corinthians, or Paul's letter to the church. And it is a letter. But you know, you know, there's like a lot of letters, right? There's a letter is a written form of communication. So you write something down and you send it to somebody. You know, um, but a lot of us have actually replaced writing letters with sending emails or sending texts, or maybe you communicate in those 140 character tweets. Uh, or, you know, something like that. A lot of people don't even bother emailing anymore. They don't write letters, they don't send emails. If you can't get it in 140 characters, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean. Um, you know, there's even some people in the uh, United States uh, that want to do away with teaching kids how to write cursive. I mean, tell you what, you've got to have, you got to be able to write. You've got to be able to write. But, let me just tell you this. This letter, this, this, ep this epistle that Paul writes to the church, the, an epistle is more than a letter. It's stronger than a letter. It has more impact than a letter. It's actually given, Paul has given the letter to strengthen uh, the church and to confirm the churches. In fact, let me just show you a couple of things. Look over in Acts chapter 15 and verse 41. Acts 15 verse 41. It says here, this is uh, Paul is on his second missionary journey, and he's actually he's completed the missionary the journey of, and he's gone to the uh, the leadership of the church in Jerusalem, and he is he has dealt with some issues that had come up about false doctrine, and now there was a uh, some information, a letter written as uh, how they should how the Gentile churches should behave, and so he he says. Uh, this in Acts chapter 15, verse 41, he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. All right, and then again over in Acts chapter 18 and verse, 13, verse 23, in Acts 18, 23, we see another verse here. It says, and after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Pergia in order, strengthening all the disciples. 
those two, the, those two verses, the, the verse that has the word confirming, Acts 14, 15, 41, and the word that we just read in Acts 18, 23, the word strengthening, both of those words are the same Greek word for epistle. He epistled them. He, so he strengthened them. He encouraged them. So these letters that we have from Paul in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, they are letters to you and to me for our strengthening, for our confirming of what we are supposed to be doing and who we are supposed to be and our, all of our behaviors and all of those kind of things. So every book in the New Testament, except for the Gospels, which is a declaration of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and except for the book of Acts, which is a transition of the church from Jewish to Gentile, and uh, the book of Re- Revelation, which is prophecy, all the, all the rest of these books are titled the Epistle of to a group of people. And it's, a, it's an epistle because Paul and the writers of these epistles, whether it was John or Peter uh, or James, they write these epistles to strengthen and to confirm us. And so it's important that we understand that. Paul said in verse 2 of, this, of 2 Corinthians 3.2, he says, they represent the truth that God has done a work in their life. They do. They represent that. You actually represent that as well. You represent that to the whole world. You and I represent God working in the world. You want to see evidence of God? Look at yourself. You want to know God is working? Look at, it, look at His followers. You want to know that God is doing something? That God is real? You're the example. We have a Bible? Okay, fine. But we have living epistles as well. And you can strengthen and confirm the world that God is and God does. So, let me just talk about your content as a living epistle. What should be on your page? What should, you, what should, you, what should people read from you? What, you? what should you communicate? We must first, the first message that you and I need to be able to possess is what we would call the gospel, right? If you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll just go there and read that. We need to be able to, con- to contain or to declare the gospel by our life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you stand, or which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye have re- you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Okay, so this is the truth that Paul declared unto us in verse 1. The truth, he declared it. He, he made it known, right? Uh, the word declare, that's what it means. It means to make known. And then in verse 3, what did he do in verse 3? Verse 1, he said, I declare it. Verse 3, I delivered it to you. I gave you this gospel message. I'm giving it to you now. You as a believer in Jesus Christ have at least that message alone, and that's a powerful message. You have the message to deliver. You received it. Now you need to deliver it to somebody else. That is what God wants us to do. That's why we are living epistles. We are the voice of the living Word of God. We have on our life a, a, a written testimony of Christ and the Gospel. Now, I know what you know. You know what it means to be delivered, right? If you've ever ordered a pizza at 10 o'clock at night, had it delivered, you know what it means, right? Delivery means to bring it to somebody. Bring it to you. You, you called and said, hey, Pizza Hut, send me a pizza, and they delivered it to you. They brought it to you. So when we deliver the Word of God, we're supposed to deliver that, to bring it to them as well. So Paul carried the message with him with the intent to declare it to everybody through delivering the truth. And our responsibility as a believer is the same as Paul's. We are also to make known this gospel message that was delivered to us. And so Here's the thing. He received it directly from Jesus Christ. All right, if you look over in 
uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 12. This is what he says in Galatians about his own salvation. He says, I neither received it from man, of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He received the truth of the gospel directly from Christ himself on the road to Damascus as he was about to go to Damascus in order to persecute the believing church. He was going to go arrest people. He was going to execute them if necessary. He was going to kill them for being a Christian. And then he met Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ said, I died, I was buried, I rose again. And Paul said, what would you have me to do now, Lord? Because I believe you now. He was, the message was delivered to him. He received it that way. And then he delivered the message. That was what he did the rest of his life. He delivered that message. Every, let's see, where am I at? Here we go, wrong page. Okay, so this is the greatest message. This is the greatest message that you and I can ever have in our possession, that we, that we give that message and that we share that message. John also gave us a message to carry. John also laid it out in the book of 1 John. And he gave us a message that is vitally important. Paul was used uh, to write by God. He was, he was used by God to write much of the New Testament, especially regarding the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the church. Uh, his qualifications, uh, his background fit the task of, of giving all of that information out. He, he fit what God needed was to share and to teach us all of that. So that was where Paul was at. John, on the other hand, John wasn't like Paul. John spent his days as a commercial fisherman. That was his life. He, he just fished. He went out, he caught fish, he took it to the market, and he sold it. He went out the next day, caught fish, took it to the market, and sold it. That was what he did. So he's different. But yet, John was not like Paul in that sense, but he was connected to Christ the way Paul wasn't. Literally, he had laid his head on the breast of Jesus Christ, and he heard the very heartbeat of God. So what he communicated was different than what, John, what Paul communicated. What John was communicating was an intimate bond with Jesus Christ. Jesus, uh, Paul, Paul was communicating truth, and he was communicating passion, and he was communicating things that we needed to understand. But John, when he wrote his, his letters, his epistles, he said, I, I, want you, I want to give you the heart of God. I want to give you the heart. This is actually, I think, sometimes what we mess up on. The message, we understand the gospel, but we don't understand the other messages that we're supposed to deliver to the, to, the, to the world. Turn over to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. I just want to start there for just a moment. Um, we're actually going to take a, a survey of the book of First John. First John chapter one, we'll just read down to the first five verses, is that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye, may al ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. <clears throat> so just like Paul, John had direct contact with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3 again for just a moment. Look back there again at verse 3. He said that he declares that, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. He has, he's declaring that he both saw and that he handled or that he touched Jesus Christ. And we together can have that same experience. We can see and we can hear and we can have fellowship with Jesus Christ. John was so concerned that you don't miss this that he even said it again in verse 5. Look at verse 5. He says, this then, he makes it a point, this then is the message I declare unto you. 
And so, that what he's saying is, is that God is everything. The, the, for the rest of his epistle, for the rest of this letter, what, what John actually does is he details the message that you already have in your possession if you have truly received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have this message that he is going to open up for us. The unfortunate reality for many Christians is that they barely acknowledge Paul's message of the gospel and they completely miss the message that John talks about of a loving and personal and powerful relationship with Christ. Most of the time, oh, I'm supposed to tell people about, about the gospel. And you are. You should be sharing that message. If, at, any, at, at the bare minimum, we should be sharing the gospel. But there's so much more about the relationship that you have with Christ that you should be sharing. And John gives us this detail. He says, this is what it is. This is the message, and I want you to know what it is, and I want you to share it with other people. A few months ago, I was reading through the book of 1 John, and I noticed a simple little unassuming phrase that just kept being used over and over and over again. And if you've been around this church for any length of time, you probably have heard about what we call the principles of Bible study, right? The principles of Bible study. And usually we talk about context. That's usually the one we kind of point at. We say, uh, we, all, we always want to make sure that we get the context of a scripture or a passage so that we understand what is being said, right? I think everybody gets that. But there's another principle that doesn't get as much airtime, that doesn't get as much play uh, in, uh, in places like this right now. And this is what I would call uh, a principle of repeated phrases or repeated words. There's several places in the Bible where I can think of right now where, the, where God repeats things. In just a few short verses, He'll repeat the same type of thing over and over and over again. And I think you need to pay attention to those things because I don't believe that God wants to waste words. And so if He says it in His Bible, He says it for a reason. So if He says it more than once, that ought to be an indication that it's important to God. And if He says it three times, it ought to be an important that. That is the indication that it's really important to God. Well, this is what he did in this little phrase. The phrase is, this is. This is. Just two little words. This is. He said it nine times in the, in the book of 1 John. And I was like, wow, that just kind of stood out at me that day. I mean, I've read through 1 John many times. You probably have too. And you just kind of go past those words. Right? But I it just kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, pay attention. Nine times I'm using this is. Each of the, what he's doing here with each of these things is it's repeated nine times and it gives us seven truths, seven messages that we should be able to communicate to the world about who God is and about our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go through these in the short time I have left. Okay, so we're going to go through fast. Here's the first one. We have the message of eternal life. Not just the gospel, but the fact is that you as a believer have eternal life. How many of you ever just walked around and said, Ted P, hey, I got eternal life. I've got eternal life. I'm going to live forever, praise the Lord. No matter what happens to my body, I'm going to live forever. That is a message that you and I have. Look at chapter 2, verse 25. <clears throat> he says in verse 2, Chapter 2, verse 25, and this is, there it is, this is, this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. He said it again in, in, in chapter 5, verse 11, just as kind of a restatement of it. If you flip over there real quick, he says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Now, I can appreciate what Paul had to say about eternal life. You know what Paul said? He, he said a couple of different places. One time he said uh, to the church at Corinth in the second letter, he said that, uh, that uh, how did he say it? I am willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Because he knew, understood that no matter what happens to him, he is going to be with God. So he has eternal life. That was Paul's attitude. That was great. He also said to the, to the church at Philippi, he said to them, I am in a strait betwixt two. 
She says, I don't know why. I, I would rather be in heaven with God, but I, it's more needful that I stay here with you and teach you some more and train you some more. He understood he had eternal life, and that's great. That's powerful. That's wonderful. That's a great message. The stark reality for every one of us is that death is imminent. For all but, death does not need to be the end. It is the beginning. We step into eternal life. We leave this world and we move into an eternal life world with God. In Matthew chapter 19, we won't turn there, but in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, a young man came up to Jesus Christ and he asked that age-old question, what good thing should I do? This is just how he worded it, but it's basically, how can I live forever, right? He says, what shall I do to have eternal life? What, what can I do to get eternal life? It's ages. It's an ageless question because nobody really be, is able to give eternal life, but everybody wants to live forever. Everybody wants to live forever. Even the goal of medical science, the goal of medical science is to improve your life and prolong your life on this earth. Sometimes now, I mean, the life expectancy of people, I got this statistic for you here, the average lifespan has increased on an average of three months per year since 1900. In 1900, the average, the, the life expectancy was 50 to 55. Today, it's, it, it exceeds 85. But it still ends. It's not eternal. Eternal life is still unattainable outside of God, who is the giver of life. And you have that message because you have that life. You have eternal life is in Jesus Christ alone, the Bible says. Turn in your Bible. Look at, the, look at John chapter 10, verse 28. John 10, 28. It says this. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I give eternal life, he says. I give it to them. And Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have eternal life. You and I, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as somebody who has accepted Christ as Savior, we have eternal life. What a message that is. So we have two messages so far, right? We have the message of the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. Three days later, he rose victoriously out of the grave, and he is alive in heaven today, and you have eternal life. That's powerful. That's a message that you ought to be able to share with anybody and everybody. How can we not share that message with the rest of the world? I mean, the rest of the world is dying. The lost world especially, they're all going to hell. Unfortunately, unless we do something about it, unless we communicate, unless we become the living epistle that God has said you are. You are already in a living epistle. What is being said of you? What is being read of you? That's the question we have to answer. Number two, the second thing that, Paul, that John says is in chapter 3, verse 11. He says, in John 3, 11, he says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So this message is that we have the love of God. We have the unlimited love of God. God never withholds His love. He never says, I'm not going to love anybody. And that there is not a person walking or that has ever walked on this earth that God does not love. All of the people that we don't love, God loves them. And God says, you should love them too. Everybody does love somebody, right? I hope. And somebody loves you, I hope. But let me just tell you, God loves you. When Jesus was challenged on what was the greatest commandment in Matthew chapter 22, he answered in two parts. He said, love God and love others. He didn't say, love those that are like you. He didn't say, love those that have your same political persuasion. He didn't say, love those that... Uh, have the same background as you. He said, love others as yourself. So we're supposed to love everybody. That is the message that we communicate. And sometimes it doesn't come across that way to the lost world, though. Sometimes it comes across as the Christians are a bunch of harsh, egotistical, bigoted, uh, rude, obnoxious people. And that's a shame. Because if you are trying to be the living epistle that God wants, you're also swimming upstream against the Christians that are swimming downstream, getting away from all of that. And it's a shame. We need to change that. We can't change them, but we sure can change us. And we can swim upstream.
Look over at John chapter, or 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Starting in verse 7, he expounds on the ability to love other people. So, you see this whole letter, is, this whole epistle is about this message that you carry. Starting in verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. If this is, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Wherein, herein is love, not that he loved us, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. We need to love people. That is the message that we need to communicate, that I do care about you. I care about your soul. I care about what's happening to you for eternity. I want you to know that I care about you. And number three, the third message that we have is that the message of God came in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. In in 1 John 4, verse 3, it says this, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. There's a lot of people out there that want to say that Jesus Christ is not God. Jesus Christ is not uh, the living example of God. He is God. When, Jesus, when God came to the earth, He came in the form of a man named Jesus Christ. But you and I know differently, amen? We know that God is Jesus Christ. God is Christ. Christ is God. We understand that. We have that message. We have the ability to share that information. Paul said it in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of uh, godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He says it plainly and clearly right there. And you and I have that message, and we should be able to proclaim that message to the world. Paul's explanation in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, we won't turn there right now, but you can make a note of it and look at it later, clearly shows that Christ and God are one. And Scripture, all throughout Scripture, tells us that Jesus Christ is God. How does He do that? How does the Scripture do that? By the names and the titles given to God, or given to Jesus Christ. He's called God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, He says, the calling of the Son of God by the title of, O God. And And he's referred to as the Son of God in Matthew chapter 16. He's called the Alpha and the Omega in the book of Revelation. He's the Holy One in Acts chapter 3. By the worship that's given to him as well, we know that he is God. By the offices of deity that is ascribed to him, we know that he is God. He's claimed the right to forgive people. He said, who can forgive but God? He said, well, uh, I can. Uh, I'm God. I can forgive. He raised the dead. He is the giver of life. And Paul wrote about Jesus Christ that he was involved, he was present, he was part of creation. He was there, present, because he is the creator. Okay, so we've got several messages so far. We have the gospel, we have eternal life is available to all, we have love is available to all, we have that God has dwelt among us. Number four, we have the instructions for life and living. In chapter 5 and verse 3, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Some have referred to the Bible as the handbook for life and living. And I would agree with that. I think it's a true statement. You know why? Because every struggle that plagues us, every situation that we get into, everything that happens to our life can be addressed. Let me restate that. It is addressed in the Bible. Everything that happens to us is addressed in the Bible. There is nothing that happens that cannot be addressed by Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like us, or like as us, or like as we, yet, not, yet without sin. The only reason... I'll just put it this way. The only reason that God's Word cannot help you in the struggles that you're dealing with right now is because of the complications that we pile onto that by our own doing. 
We don't let God's Word work in our life. And then we blame God for not being able to fix the problem that we have. We tell you right now, if we would just listen to the instructions of God, we would be able to fix the problems in our life. Because this book has the answers to life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 13. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. The words of God, the instructions for life, if we would just listen to them, if we would just follow them, first off, it would protect us from falling into sin, and it helps us to get out of it by correcting ourselves. Number five, we have the message. This is a great one. We have the message of victory over the world. Verse five, chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. To experience victory in anything, in anything that you deal with, to experience victory is to experience a small sample of what Jesus Christ has given to us when He claimed victory over the grave. Every time you win a game, every time you get any, any kind of victory in anything, it's just a it's just it's like a just a minute piece of what it's like to say that we have victory over the grave. So often though we live I didn't remember several years ago we had a missionary here by the name of Doug. Remember Doug Pearson? And he said this. He preached this message. Are you do you are you are you victorious or are you a victim? Let's not live like victims. Let's live like we have victory. I know of several people in this church that have had glorious victories because of Christ. Amen. Absolutely. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57 say this, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who giveth us the victory through, Lord, through our Lord Jesus Christ. The world offers us nothing of eternal importance. We have known sin, right? We've all known sin. We've experienced it. We've done it. We've done disease. We've seen it. We know what it looks like. We've had diseases. We understand it. We've had deaths in our family. You're not dead yet because you're here, but you've had death in your family. And the many failings of the world do nothing for us, but we have victory and we have overcome the world. John chapter 16 and verse 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace in the world. Ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. They have told us in the Word of God that we have victory, but we live like victims. We live in such a way that we don't experience the joy of the Lord. We don't understand why. And we can't communicate the truth to people when we live as a victim because what they read is victim instead of victor. You're in a living epistle. We have to deliver the correct message. The sixth message that, Paul, that John talks about is that we have the message that God hears us. God does hear us. Chapter 5 and verse 14, look over there. And this is the confidence, I love that, we have confidence in this, that we, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. We know that He hears us. Such a comfortable, comforting thing to know that God hears when you call. God hears. He's not, it's not like he, He's not paying attention, it's not like you've got to leave Him a voicemail and hope He gets back to you. Uh, I mean, that's sometimes how we approach our prayer life, right? I left God a voicemail. I'm waiting to hear from Him. Don't do that. He hears you when you pray. He's listening right then and there. It's as if you entered into the, boldly into the throne of God, into, the, into His kingdom, into His presence, and you are praying. You don't, it's like, hey, God, how you doing? I mean, He's right there. You're praying. You don't, he is listening. He hears exactly what you're saying. The peace that, bring, that that brings is incredibly comforting because while we may think we're alone, we're not. God is present with us and He listens to us. Jeremiah said it the best. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. 
Call, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, he said. You know how he answers? Because he hears. I'm reminded of the story. We won't take the time to go back there and look at it. But over in 1 Kings chapter 18 was the story of, of um, uh, Elijah and, and the, the, the priests of Baal, right? And he, he puts this, uh, this challenge out there. He said, okay, you build an altar, put the fire up there, and stack all the wood, and let's just see if your God hears you. All right, you get to go first. You get to prove that your God is existence. And he says in chapter 18, verse 27, this is what he said to them. He said, cry aloud, for he, for, for he is a God. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing, or he's on a journey, or maybe he's asleep, and he must be woke up. Your God isn't like that. Because he said later on, in a few verses later, O oh Lord, hear me, that the people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. And he responded immediately to his prayer. This is how God does. He listens to us. He hears us. This is a great message. We don't have to worry uh, about not hearing from God, God not hearing from us, but we need to let the world know that God does hear. God does respond. The last message that, I want, that we see from John is in chapter 5 and verse 20. And this is really a summation kind of, a, kind of thing, a kind of books, bookends, chapter 1, verse 5. And he says... We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Everything is kind of wrapped up in all of that, right? This is the true God and eternal life. All that we have seen so far is part of all of that. God is real. God does care. He does love us. He wants us to be victorious. We can talk to Him, and He wants you to be saved. This is the message that you and I carry with us. This is what we should be transmitting to people. As a living epistle, when people see us, they should see this in us. Really, this is what we should be declaring. This is what we should be sharing at all times, every place we go. So the point of all of this is this. Let me just wrap it all up here and say this. You all are a living epistle. Your purpose is to proclaim God in the world. You have at least eight powerful and true messages to share with your community. Let's just go down the list again real quick. Number one, Christ has risen from the dead. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a great message. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot right there, but Christ has risen from the dead, and eternal life is available to all. Eternal life is available for everybody. Not only that, but love is available to everybody. These are great messages that we should be living out in our life every day, and every person that sees us should see these messages. God has dwelt among us. God is real, and He came down to the earth, and He experienced everything that you experienced, and He knows everything that you know, and He, and he is going to take, take care of everything if you just surrender to Him. We have the instructions for life and living. We are victorious in Christ. We are comforted knowing that God hears us, and all that God is and does is true. This is what the message that a believer should take to the world. So I don't have anything to say. Yes, you do. I don't, know what to talk, I don't know what to talk about. Yes, you do. Don't talk about anything but what you know, which is this. You know that you have eternal life. You know that you're victorious over sin. You know that God hears you. You know that, that He loves you. He, you know all of these things. This is what you need to tell people. Okay, so for the sake of time, remember I said that the Bible's at the beginning of the, of the time here together this morning. I said the Bibles that we assembled were meant to be delivered to somebody who will profit eternally. All right? The same is true of you living epistles. God wants to deliver you to somebody who will profit eternally. This is the living epistle, and so are you. So we sent the Bibles, but our job is not done. You and I have a responsibility to be the living epistle that God calls us to be. You and I have some things that we can do to take part in and be a participant in and to share in the message that we have. You know, let me just say this. You don't even have to ask questions. You don't have to say, can I talk to you a minute? Hey, let me tell you what God gave me. Just, you know, you're, we all, I think, understand that the greatest way to witness to somebody is to share your own testimony. So just go tell somebody, hey, you know what? God, heard, God hears me. That'll blow people's mind. You stop them and say, hey, you know, let me tell you that God listens to me. What? I don't even think there is a God. Oh, yeah, there is a God. God is true. See, that's message number eight right there. See, you already got two messages before you even got started. Okay, so here's the thing. 
We need workers. We need workers to sign up, which is really something we shouldn't have to say for the, for the Burnt District Festival. Put that out there. I shouldn't have to say we need people to sign up. I should be saying we have so many people we don't know what to do with them because every one of us ought to be able to share, want to share the message. Now, I know that, you know, the people are busy and bow season's up right now and I wish I was there, but uh, you know what? We have an opportunity to take the living epistles and be the living epistles and share the word of God, share the love of God, share the truth of God, share the victory of God, share the, the, the grace of God, share all of that. But why do we have to beg people to sign up? I'm, I'm being a little hard here, I know, um, but it, it just seems to me like I'm just, you know, for two hours, just go and stand on the street and tell people your testimony. Share that you're in the living epistle. The harvest party is coming up at the end of October, on the 28th of October. And we're still looking for people to have a booth so that you can tell people on your own church's property that God loves them. We, should, we, should have, and not, we shouldn't be hoping for 20. We should be thinking, well, we got 60 booths. That's too much. I mean, we ought to just, we, have, we are living epistles. We should do something about it. I know people are busy. I get all of that. Uh, I'm busy too, but for just a couple hours, go and share this message of being a living epistle. Change Lives Block Party is coming up, I think, on the 21st? 14th. 14th. Oh, that's just a couple weeks away. All right, so just go and hang out and eat, eat food from Shane and share the, God, share the love of God with people. There's so many more ways that we can be an epistle of Jesus Christ because that's what Christ wants for us. He wants us to be read of all men. And we need to do it. And we just need to take action. So we sent the Bibles out. You rallied around the Bibles. You got your hands on the Bible. We finished so fast that we had to find more work to do. It was great. It was awesome. But we're not done. The printed Word went. Now the living Word needs to go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're just so thankful for this time.